In my video about Earthbound, I covered how the game tackled relationships and how strong relationships shape us. In passing, I mentioned how when the party members leave, the game gets harder because you feel the loss of that teammate. You are weaker in their absence. Mother 3 takes that concept further, asking the question, what if you lost someone and they never came back? How does this sudden loss mold you? How do you deal with that grief? Do you take the memories of the person with you and heal, or do you shut them away and become callous? In Mother 3, we also see how mankind affects the environment it invades, altering its equilibrium and chipping away at the balance in nature. Welcome to Tasmali Village, and welcome to the end of the world as we know it. Tasmali is a wooded utopia. The town itself is indistinguishable from the land in which it lies. Sitting on the western region of the Nowhere Islands, Tasmali is surrounded by water and unexplored biomes. Legend has it that the islands are protected by a sleeping dragon beneath the surface of the land, shielding the people from the calamities happening everywhere else. In perfect harmony, the nature and the people who live there thrive on each other. The animals are kind because they have no reason to fear the citizens who coexist with them. But Tasmali, as we see it, is slowly dying. An ignored splinter is beginning to smart beneath the skin. Not enough that it needs to be immediately removed, but if it's left unmended any longer, the pain will begin to spread. The people of Tasmali are blissfully unaware of financial gain and self-importance. Everyone lives within their means, thriving off the land, ready to lend a hand to their neighbors. Rather than sell wares at the local shop, residents can borrow and use items as needed. Thomas, the bazaar's owner, is happy to restock the goods as soon as more materials are discovered. The town lives and breathes as one organism in that sense. Even the prison in the town square has never been used. It is a formality that it even exists. But Tasmali's health begins to decline from the time the story starts. After years of symbiotic living, nature appears to be striking back against the town. The forest catches fire, sending the town into a frenzy to save anyone caught in the blaze. This is when we are introduced to Flint, a fearless leader of Tasmali's tribe. He might not like you, but he's never going to let that get in the way of helping you if you need it. He's a traditional man's man through and through. When his family goes on vacation, he stays behind to watch the farm. The next time we come to visit, let's ask one of the neighbors to tend to the sheep so we can all come up here as a family. His wife Hanawa sends home to him. She wishes Flint could be there to watch their twin sons Lucas and Klaus have fun because they are growing up quickly, especially Klaus, the more adventurous of the two boys. Lucas is a sensitive boy, still growing up and a bit lost in Klaus's shadow. Hanawa and her father Alec discuss how quiet he is, hoping he can grow up and fend for himself as he ages. They love him nonetheless. But the letter home will turn out to be the last time Flint will hear from his beloved wife. As Hanawa and the boys travel home from Alec's house in North Tasmali, the wildfires break out and the wildlife starts to turn on the civilians. Reports of screams and the lack of communication from Hanawa start eating at Flint, and he continues to search for his family. His reunion with the boys is bittersweet. The twins are huddled under blankets and shivering, drenched from the river they were found in. Hanawa is nowhere to be found until Brosnan, a blacksmith and stand-in town sheriff, appears holding the fang of a drago, a species of dinosaur that was considered peaceful until this very moment. The fang was discovered, Brosnan struggles to utter, pierced through Hanawa's heart. In this moment, Flint flies off the handle, unsure of how to process the information he has just received.
This is Tasmalee's turning point. From the time the forest catches fire and Flint becomes the first prisoner in the jail, Tasmalee is set on a collision course with its demise. After Flint escapes the prison, he makes his way to Hanawa's grave, confirming that the night before wasn't a nightmare, but an inescapable hell. Klaus is nowhere to be found. After twisting Lucas's arm, he confesses Klaus is ascending the mountains to confront the Drago, who killed Hanawa, and get vengeance on it for taking her away. Flint races off with Alec to find Klaus, but all they find are his shoes. His shoes and a Drago with mechanical components surgically added to it, and a fang missing from its mouth. This is no longer the kind species of Drago Tasmalee is familiar with and trusts their kids to play with. This is a mechanical monstrosity only a human with a twisted heart could produce. After landing a knockout blow on the Mecha Drago, Alec holds Flint back, telling him not to kill the Drago. He would only be doing to its family what it did to Flint's, and that wouldn't bring Hanawa back. The two leave and go home. Klaus is gone, lost somewhere among the mountains. But Flint is focused on one goal every day from then on. He searches the mountain each and every day for his lost son, only taking breaks to visit his wife's grave. Lucas is lost in the shuffle. He lost his entire familial support system in one day. His mother died protecting him, his brother disappears in the mountains, and losing Hinawa and Klaus turn Flint into a shell of his former self. Mother 3 departs from the traditional mother experience in that the game is broken up into chapters, allowing you to play as different characters. We don't take over as Lucas until four chapters into the game, three years after the wildfire. Tasmali is different now. Instead of the village fitting into the wilderness, the town and buildings have overtaken the forests and natural landscape. Industry is booming. Finance has taken over. In the years between the fires and present day, an appropriately named traveler named Facade and his dancing monkey named Salsa have been spreading the word of capitalism, promising new levels of happiness to the people of Tasmali if they follow his directions. But behind closed doors, Facade is holding Salsa against his will, abusing him with a shock collar when he doesn't follow his directions to the T. Facade uses Salsa to pitch happy boxes to the villagers, which we can see are televisions that play around-the-clock content provided by the pig masks. The pig masks are a horrific organization pulling the strings of the new Tasmalee. They employ the citizens of Tasmalee and pay them in dragon power currency that the people can conveniently go spend at Club Tittyboo, a nightclub sponsored by the pig masks. These stormtrooper-esque clones represent a fascist uprising in Tasmalee and Facade is one of the leaders. They run Tasmalee with fear tactics, threatening a bolt of lightning to any home that refuses a happy box. As far as anyone in town can tell, the lightning strikes are an act of nature. However, Facade keeps tabs on all the citizens who do not follow his preachings. For the citizens who do follow this new way of financial gain, they feel like they are moving up in the world, but they are oblivious to the pig masks harvesting the land and playing god with all the wildlife in the area. In order to build a stronger defense, the pig masks take all the animals on the Nowhere Islands and bring them to a lab so they can experiment on them and surgically modify them with mechanical components. They also take multiple species and combine them just for the sake of doing it. These chimera line the land and overtake the animals in Tasmalee and the surrounding forests and caves, but the wildlife aren't the only ones affected by the regime. Families are uprooted so the pig masks can create a training camp. Members of the small society who are unable to work are corralled into a decrepit nursing home where they are left to rot. Tasmalee becomes a ghost town as people crave more and more, abandoning their homes to move to the big city where everything is a sensory overload and artificial. Tasmalee's decay destroyed me. It really tore into me seeing the town square fall empty and silent. The few people who were left talk about the village like it was this horrible place stuck in the past when not too long ago they loved it. And now, all that's left is animosity, no desire to restore it to its former glory. All of this is part of a larger plan. The pig mask's true goal is to find the seven magic needles that keep the sleeping dragon under the Nowhere Island asleep in order to bring about the end of the world. The dragon will manifest the heart of the person who pulled the needles. If the person who pulls the needles is pure of heart, the dragon will be an ally to the people. If the puller is shrouded by anger, greed, and hatred, the dragon will become a violent, world-ending force. This is where Lucas comes in. In order to prevent a catastrophic end to the world, Lucas meets interdimensional beings known as Magipsies who guard the needles. The boy we were introduced to as a timid runt of the litter is capable of greater power than he could have ever imagined. 
Only he can use the power of Psy Love and pull the needles himself, influencing the dragon to be pure of heart. He just has to keep growing, stay focused, face his fears, and gain strength inwardly and outwardly. Despite passing away years before, Hanawa still plays a major role in Lucas's life. The impression she left can be felt as soon as we take over Lucas. When he tries to leave home in his pajamas, he has a flashback to when Hanawa told him to change clothes before going out to play. When he looks in the mirror, he remembers his mother lovingly brushing his hair. In many ways, Lucas uses his mother as a moral compass that guides his decisions toward good. She appears to him and speaks to him when he needs her. But Lucas clearly carries the weight of his grief with him. When Lucas awakens in a field of sunflowers and he sees his mother appear, hovering over the edge of a cliff, he puts no second thought into jumping out and reaching for her, falling to what surely would have been an early demise had Alec and the local thief Wes had not placed a pile of hay out to shield him from impact. When Lucas and his party arrive at Tane Tane Island, his biggest fears and regrets are revealed. After accidentally eating magic mushrooms, Lucas and the party start having vivid hallucinations that poke at their insecurities. Mailboxes are strewn about, and peering into them will reveal the sound of Lucas crying or unending darkness. Lucas sees Klaus standing in front of him. He is confronted by a projection of Flint threatening to beat him. Deep down, Lucas blames himself for Hanawa's death and Klaus's disappearance. If only he was stronger, maybe he could have protected Hanawa or talked Klaus out of chasing the Drago. And maybe then he'd still have a father who was engaged in life and happy. Lucas carries this fear that maybe he could have done something to change his family's fate, and maybe had he done that, he could have saved Tasmalee from abandonment. But even after having these waking nightmares, Lucas wakes up, shakes himself off, and continues on with his mission to secure and pull the needles. By carrying his past with him, it's a tattooed reminder that he can't return to how things used to be. He can only move forward. In that same vein, the characters introduced throughout the story are on their own sorts of journeys parallel to Lucas's. Mother 3 presents its NPCs in a fascinating way. The people who live in Tasmalee are each individually designed, and none are repeated sprites. And as pig masks begin to take over, you start to lose sense of who is who and who the person is behind the mask. These soldiers are faceless and nameless. There are hundreds you see in the game, all using the same repeated sprite and none of them have their own identity. It's like once you fall into the trap of a fascist regime, you lose all sense of individuality and become an expendable cog in the machine. I mention this because of how different the beginning of the game feels compared to the end after the invasion. Early on when you walk around Tasmalee, you become familiar with the people who live there, and you learn who they are and what they do and which houses they live in and who they are related to. Each character, even ones you see once, has their own routines and ambitions and things that make them angry or sad. When you invade Club Tittyboo and are sneaking through the attic, you fight a bunch of musical instruments who are broken and unused. They are mad that they are past their prime or past usefulness and are tossed aside for newer instruments. Even an item that gets picked up, the Rope Snake, has his own journey. This item is a character with his own goals and purpose. He is used to cross gaps and help the party escape. But as the party hangs on to him, relying on him to make their escape from capture, his jaw gives out, unable to sustain the extensive weight of carrying a child, two adults, and a dog. When he fails and the weight gives way to the party tumbling down to earth, he is defeated. He is upset. He feels useless, like he was made for one thing and he couldn't even do it right. There is a moment where he puts this failure behind him and tries again, letting the team once again lean on him to carry them to the next location. But again, even after trying his best, he fails and his jaw slips, sending the party down to the ground again. The rope snake missed a step in his redemption arc. He put his failure behind him, determined to get better. But he tries to carry the team without training or making the moves to get stronger. He wasn't ready to try again. The last NPC I want to mention is a minor character, one that you interact with for no more than 30 seconds and then never again. But it's a character that will stick with me when I think back on my time with Mother 3. I hardly think it's a spoiler to say that you will eventually face off with Facade and defeat him. It's a triumph, it's a long battle, and he's a worthy opponent. When it's all over, you feel accomplished because you vanquished this evil that destroyed Lucas's home. But after you travel to where Facade lives, you meet a mouse that lived there with him. As you arrive, the mouse talks about how Facade is the only person who has ever treated him well, and how lonely he is without him. Then he asks, do you think he'll be coming home soon? This moment tore me apart. 
It felt like I had just ruined this innocent little pet's life by defeating his master and friend. It made me realize that while Fassad was a major villain throughout the game, even though he was horrible and ruined Tasmali and brought a blight to the land, that even he wasn't evil to everyone all the time. Killing Fassad was a net positive, no doubt, but even the person you hate most is loved by somebody who sees a different side of them. As Lucas, you do the right thing, but it doesn't feel as good as it seems like it will when the deed is done. It kind of puts everything that happens in the game in a new perspective. It forces you to see your actions through someone else's eyes. Mother 3 is a bleak experience, but it's one I recommend fully. Find an emulator, buy a good reproduction cart that has save functionality intact, it's worth the effort or the money. As a current end to the Mother series, it's a beautifully written conclusion. It captures how you can handle grief when someone passes, and as time passes in game and you see how Tasmali dies along with Lucas's innocence, it will gut you. It's not a game for the faint of heart. It will make you appreciate the world around you, it will make you value the people around you more, it will make you want to punch a fascist right in the f***ing face. It will wreck you emotionally in a beautiful way and help you process the feelings you might already be carrying with you. The only thing stopping you is not pressing start.